Uh, you know, Thea last night after her one woman great one woman comedy show said, this was the first audience where no one walked out in the middle of her presentation. Yeah, I am hoping to match that today. Um, I am unique at this gathering. It is not because I am wearing a suit, because I notice that there are many of you who are obviously well-dressed people. It is not even that I am a theist, because you know that there are secret theists among you. There are people here spying. They're spying to try to figure out what is the secret atheist agenda for America. These, by the way, are the same people who for the last several decades have been going to national conferences trying to figure out what is the secret gay agenda for America. They found out what it was. Gay people want to be treated like first-class citizens and be left alone. Now, here's why I'm unique, because I'm the only person in this room who has this. This is a monkey that single-handedly represents the two things that Christian fundamentalists fear the most, Satan and evolution. <laughs> okay, in the course of the next 25 minutes or so, I want to offer a, a few bits of, uh, shall we say, gratuitous advice about how to grow the atheist movement. This I do so that you like me better. Here's the first piece of advice. Get to know that director, Darren Aronofsky, really well. Darren Aronofsky, of course, is the man who made the Bible-themed epic, Noah, a film in which giant things that looked like transformers made out of clay helped Noah and his family nail together the ark. I'd suggest you work on a second feature, one in which the same giants in the earth helped to extract uh, Jonah from the belly of a big fish, and perhaps a third one in the trilogy where these ponderous creatures seek unsuccessfully to help Mary and Joseph find an open inn in Bethlehem. <laughs> so reporters have been calling me all week. What are you going to say to the atheists? Um, I will not be discussing questions of divinity, higher powers, the supernatural. I won't be pondering such important philosophical questions as, is there a purpose to the universe? Why does something exist rather than nothing? We'll be debating those for the next two millennia. We've got plenty of time. I'm here to urge that we all need to deal with something that all believers in secular government care about, theists and atheists and we need to work on it right now. And that is saving the heart and the soul, for you metaphorically, the heart and the soul of the First Amendment of the United States Constitution. And here's what it is. And here's what it is. This is a demand of the Constitution, that the government be rigorously neutral on matters of religion, that it never pick winners and losers among religions or between religious belief and non-belief, that it not expend one cent of tax dollars in support of any religious institution's doctrine or dogma or ministry or mission, not one penny. What could be wrong with that? What could be wrong? What could be wrong with that? Sadly, apparently people think there is something wrong with that. So today in 2014, we can be just as sure as we are that we don't know where Malaysian Airlines Flight 370 is, that we do know that there are very powerful, very well-connected political religious forces trying to upend the very idea of the separation of church and state and the freedom to believe which includes the freedom to believe or to doubt or to detest someone else's ideas. The religious freedom that's promoted by people like Sarah Palin, Bill O'Reilly, the Conference of Catholic Bishops, the religious right of Ken Ham and Tony Perkins is a fraud, it is a scam, it is antithetical to true freedom of conscience and true freedom of belief in America. So. Look, 
Far from an assault on religion generally, or Christianity in particular, we have a dizzying level of religious diversity in this country. Um, it's very important for us to recognize that. We have 2,000 different easily identifiable religious groups in the country. We have 25 to 30 million free thinkers, atheists, agnostics, and others who characterize themselves in similar ways all of them making up the intellectual landscape that is the United States of America in 2014. Christian majorities in this country have nothing to worry about. It is only you and members of some uh, less than well understood minority religious groups that ever have reason to find your liberties in jeopardy. I said that to a, com a congressional committee not too long ago headed by Arizona Republican Congressman Trent Franks. Uh, and that phrase, the dizzying level of religious freedom, did not go over uh, too well with him because he had begun that hearing asserting that religious freedom was the very basis of the United States. And he said that religious freedom goes all the way back to Christopher Columbus. Yes, Christopher Columbus, who, in Congressman Trank's, uh, Trent Frank's words, was exercising his religious freedom when he, quote, set sail from Spain to find the new world. I remembered it differently. I think he was trying to get to India when he came across this big block of land in the middle. But I have come to believe that people like Trent Franks, uh, the leadership, really, of the House of Representatives, is in a state of breathtaking ignorance and confusion about the Constitution and so many other things. And that would, that would, uh, that would include uh, John Boehner. I, I was talking to comedian um, Lewis Black last weekend, and he said, he said, John Boehner is best described as a mood ring transformed by a wizard into a member of Congress. <laughs> so right now in the 2014, we have problems from two directions. I just want to ask if there are any physicists here. Good, have figures. <laughs> Be gentle with me, because what I'm going to do here is use an analogy from physics, which may or may not be completely scientifically accurate. I'm going to call one of the dangers we pay, face a danger from momentum and the other a danger from inertia, as in the object at rest tends to stay at rest variety. Momentum to destroy the wall of separation comes via the continued presence of an extraordinarily powerful political group. The religious right is what we call them when we are being polite. This constitutes 20% of the American electorate, 20% of the American electorate. This is a movement of theocrats seeking to write public policy along their own narrow sectarian lines into the words and the statutes of the states in which we live and the country of which we are a part. I have a book on my desk called Politics According to the Bible which in its 619 pages gives a purported answer to every conceivable political issue. It doesn't just tell you what U.S. policy should do to prohibit abortion and oppose marriage equality. It drills down very deeply to explain what the Bible properly understood tells us should be the next fighter aircraft to be purchased by the United States Air Force. That's the F-22 Raptor, in case you're taking notes. Did you forget? Romans 14, 3. See, I was conned last night because he had this Bible quiz up here, and people did really good. But you didn't know the F-22 Raptors in the Bible. You ought to study it more. Many of the people who think this way, that there's a Bible answer, a literal answer to everything in the Bible, are the same people who are yammering about their alleged loss of religious liberty in America. To make the case, they need to dramatically alter the meaning of those words, religious liberty. It was Confucius who allegedly said, when words lose their meaning, the universe crumbles. If that is true, this ceiling is in deep jeopardy. In a very egregious example of what it is uh, to alter the meaning of religious liberty, these are the people who believe that even for-profit corporations whose bosses oppose contraceptives 
can refuse to cover it in their employees' health insurance plans because of the corporation's religious liberty. This was the topic of a Supreme Court argument I watched 10 days ago at the United States Supreme Court. The far right says that since corporations have free speech rights identified in that recent Citizens United case, they also have a corporate conscience. Now, one of the companies making this claim is the national do-it-yourself arts and craft chain called Hobby Lobby. The other is a Mennonite-owned furniture company called, appropriately for this conflict, Conestoga Wood. Now you get that later. Whatever you think of Citizens United, at least corporations we do know have some purpose of speaking. They do exercise speech. It's called advertising, and it's why companies pay one and a half million dollars a minute to have Danica Patrick in a bikini appear at an ad during the Super Bowl. So they do speak, but do they exercise religion? And the answer there is obviously no. Uh, if I ever happen to be sitting in a pew, I, I do that sometimes, and I see a do-it-yourself garden gnome from Hobby Lobby sitting next to me, or if I open up a wood cabinet produced by this Mennonite company, and as I open the doors, it starts to sing a verse of near my God to thee, then maybe I'll think that it actually is exercising religion. But until that happens, I'm going to just think that the boss of these companies wishes to impose his, almost universally, his viewpoint on the dozens, or in Hobby Lobby's case, thousands of women who work for that company. And that is dead wrong. Now, when, thank you. when you look at the ramifications of this, just in the healthcare field, of course, it's staggering alone. If a Catholic employer can say no coverage of birth control, certainly a Scientology employer uh, who hates uh, mental health counseling and hates psychiatry could say, I want to opt out of mental health treatment for my employees. A Jehovah's Witness company could say we're not covering surgery because so many surgeries do require the use of whole blood products, and whole blood products are anathema to the faith in which we believe. All of that. All of those medical corollaries that you hear on television are just the tip of the iceberg. Once you jump over this cliff of saying that corporations have religious rights, there's pretty much no place to go but down to the bottom. I was, for example, um, on the Laura Ingram radio show a month ago or so to discuss a lawsuit in Colorado. Two men went to a bake shop to order a cake. Somehow it became clear that the two men were themselves a happy couple and that the cake was going to be used as a post-wedding celebration for them. This was not, strictly speaking, a wedding cake because although Colorado has a lot of pot, it does not have marriage equality, sadly. So they were going to have to get married in Massachusetts, come back and have a celebration in the state of Colorado. The owner of the bakery refused to take the order for his cake masterpiece, and in fact, believe it or not, the company's name is Masterpiece Cakes. The owner's Jack Phillips. He said he couldn't make the cake because his Christian religious objections to same-sex marriage. This guy is a real piece of work. The ACLU of Colorado represented the, the, the two men in this case. And during depositions, when they get information from the people on the other side, they found some extraordinarily odd views held by Mr. Phillips, the baker. Uh, first of all, he also refuses to bake Halloween cakes. He did once, however, agree to make a cake for a wedding of two dogs. And he claimed he had, if he had to bake this cake, it would be like baking a pedophile cake whatever that is. A lower level Colorado court just ruled that if you're in the business of offering service to the public, you've got to serve the public, not just a part of the public. The judge rejected this idea that Mr. Phillips was somehow exercising his artistic talents in the production of this cake. It's a kind of surface appeal to that. I mean, after all, I mean, we all like to think you make a cake, you do something, it's, it's beautiful. It's artistic. But the service here offered to the public was not make a cake 
based on your own artistic sense, but make a cake like the people who come to your cake shop want you to make. That's the service being offered. The court even noted that the bakery still had First Amendment rights. It could hang up on the wall of its bakery. We disapprove of marriage equality. They could still utter their beliefs, but as a public institution, it had to accommodate the public. Is that so difficult to understand? Similar uh, idea was rejected in regard to a photography case at the Supreme Court just last Monday, but one of these cases will also get to the Supreme Court. So we have cases about cakes and about contraception that could still eventually lead to a conclusion that I consider quite incredibly bizarre. Religious claims trump every and all laws some corporate owner doesn't agree with. Why not just let companies refuse to go along with all the civil rights laws that are based on their religious objections? A few of us are old enough to remember that in the 1960s, we still heard on radios, transistor radios hidden under our pillows, we would hear southern preachers quoting from the book of Genesis, and God separated the light from the darkness to justify the continuation of school segregation. It's still there. How about the Equal Pay Act? Why pay those women as much as men? Because after all, man is the head of the family as Christ is the head of the church. So the hubby has more responsibility on his shoulders to pay the bills. An old-fashioned idea? Phyllis Schlafly just made national news three days ago by saying exactly the same thing. We cannot allow this kind of idiosyncratic jerry-picking of Bible text or anybody else's holy scriptures to trump the laws that apply to everybody else. That fundamentally turns the American democratic system on its head. You know, you saw all this fuss in Arizona. They were going to pass a law that would allow an LGB traveler uh, to be denied admission to a bed and breakfast or a hotel because the owner just wasn't comfortable with that. We've, uh, we also know that Governor Jan Brewer out there apparently read the Constitution and perhaps a few uh, letters from the National Football League, which could have swayed it a little more and decided they'd rather not lose the Super Bowl to Phoenix. So she vetoed the legislation not to be outdone. Just last week, though, Mississippi passed a law that's almost as bad, and it will be challenged. We've seen a wide range of cases also coming up that involve so-called religious institutions that already, under the, I think, mistaken idea of the Obama administration, are exempted from covering contraceptives. I don't think that a big hospital that serves all the people, that gets tax money from all of us, or a big university or college that gets grants from us and contracts from us, ought to have an opt-out to cover contraception but the administration does. So, here's what you have to do. I know this sounds so weird. Some of you won't even believe, you won't get this. Notre Dame, we represent three women. We're the only group that represents any real women in any of these cases, three graduate students. We, Notre Dame says, we know we're exempted from having to cover contraceptive for these women, but um, we would have to sign a statement of refusal. We would have to say, we refuse to cover contraception because of our religious beliefs, and this would, of course, then have a third party set up by government contract, cover it for all women professors and women students at Notre Dame anyway. That's all it would be. Notre Dame said no. We cannot sign such a paper, all 635 words in it, because this would trigger a response that would lead to the sinful option of birth control. Let me get this straight. Refusing to say that you will do something is the moral equivalent of actually doing it. We have beaten Notre Dame so far. That sounds like a very flimsy argument. In fact, one of the most conservative judges in this country, Judge Charles Posner, at the oral argument in the case, basically said, uh, to summarize about 30 minutes, 
said to the Notre Dame lawyer, are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? I don't know where this moral equivalency we, we refuse to say we refuse comes from. Maybe it's one of Michio Kaku's alternate multiverses. I don't really understand them. But from a legal standpoint, this argument is what is technically called making an argument that is de minimis in Latin, or in, in Mr. Deity's phrase from yesterday, uh, in common sense, a batshit crazy. <laughs> so, there are a couple of things happening. Now, I don't want to depress you because there are a couple of things that are happening that really make me wonder what the future of the religious right is in America. First, when it comes up with some bizarre ideas, like a North Carolina proposal a year ago to allow each county to align itself with a particular religion, you all know how many a pagan and Scientology counties there would be in North Carolina. A couple of comedic comments by Rachel Maddow and uh, John Stewart, and it's enough to laugh a proposal like that off the legislative table. 20 years ago, we would have had to spend tens of thousands of dollars to fight it. We're making a little progress. Second, more importantly, the primary polling organization for evangelical Christians is called the Barna Group. The Barna Group has been reporting for the last year and a half that the religious right is losing its grip on its own kids. Guess what? When you lose your own children, you're starting on a trajectory called defeat. Here's what they're finding. Growing percentage. Growing percentage of fundamentalist young people now accept the evidence for evolution. And an astonishing 64% of evangelical millennials between 20 and 30 now support marriage equality. 64% of fundamentalist kids support marriage equality. That's a hell of a trajectory. Hey, remember, you know, remember Rick Santorum? This, see, this is, this, I have to admit this, this is the time when I wish I did, you know, PowerPoint, because now at this point I could say, do you remember Rick Santorum? And then we could have an unflattering photograph of Rick up here. But, but I, I don't do PowerPoint because I think it causes autism. Um, <laughs> Rick, Rick, Rick Santorum said during the 2012 Republican presidential uh, campaign primary, he said he wasn't so sure it was good to have all this federal money going to scholarships for students to go to colleges and universities because he said you, you send a student to college and she becomes an atheist. Well, the data, yeah, the data on that overall is a little slim, but there's a certain kernel of truth to what he said. A lot of young people in this country go to religious high schools or are homeschooled and never hear the word evolution. One third of the public school students in this country go graduate from a public high school and never hear the word evolution because biology teachers are afraid to utter it. When they go to college and they hear about evolution, all of a sudden they start to accept the evidence for it and at least reject the Bible literalism that would otherwise require them to believe that the earth is only 6,000 years old. After the great Bill Nye Ken Ham debate, how many of you saw that? Yeah, it's good. Who won? No, I'm only kidding. <laughs> the next day, Pat Robertson got on television and said Ken Ham should not have had that debate because to argue that an earth is 6,000 years old is foolish and it makes Christians look stupid. That's Pat Robertson. We're moving him. It's incremental, but we may make it. And how about this? These are the same young people go to college. They've been taught by their parents that there is this gay agenda, not the one I mentioned, but this one where, among other things, gay people are out to... Uh, virtually kidnap straight people and turn them into homosexuals. But then these same students find out halfway through their first uh, year in college that one of the people on their own floor in the dormitory is gay and that that person has not tried to seduce him in the shower, not even once. 
See, reality-based experience and education really can go a long way to terminating utter nonsense. We're not out of the cold, dark woods yet, though. More insidious threat comes from what Michael Lewis might call moral inertia. This is what moral inertia is. A belief that so long as it serves the narrow self-interest of everybody inside it, no one on the inside would ever seek to change it, no matter how corrupt or sinister it became. Let me give you a couple examples from Washington. Start with money for religious groups. George W. Bush started a program he called the Faith-Based Initiative, an effort to get more grants and contracts to religious providers of secular services, things like mentoring students or feeding the hungry. It was based on the largely mythological claim he was really good at that, weapons of mass destruction. Anyway, this is another mythological claim that there was widespread discrimination in giving government funds to religious groups. At the very time he said that, Catholic Charities alone appeared to be getting about $500 million in assistance from you. Except you, you didn't pay. <laughs> Salvation Army is literally a Christian denomination. It got $89 million that year in the state of New York alone. If that's discrimination, where do we sign up for it? Now, Bush did recognize that you couldn't force people to convert to religion. You couldn't force them to participate in religious services to get help, although plenty of organizations tried. But he did allow groups to get subsidies, even where they refused to hire people in those government-subsidized programs just because they had different religious beliefs. So you could literally hang up a sign in a Baptist homeless shelter that said, no Jews or atheists need apply as if humanists tucked in the bedsheets differently than those Baptists did. This reversed executive orders that went back as far as the Truman administration, uh, barring religious discrimination in hiring with taxpayer dollars. When candidate Barack Obama addressed this matter back in 2008, he said this practice would stop when he was elected. It's now 2014, the practice still continues as it did under Mr. Bush, but with even more money going to religious groups. World Vision, whose president is a frequent visitor to the White House, will not hire any, Trinitari uh, any non-Trinitarian Christians for any permanent employment, even in predominantly Muslim or Hindu nations, where that company operates. It's funded in part with 200 million of your dollars. World Vision sees no problem with this, though it disclaims that their policy is even discriminatory. Noted one official from World Vision, we tell them in advance that we only hire Christians, so it is not discrimination. <laughs> right, we told you. Mrs. Parks, we told you when you bought the ticket, you had to sit on the back of the bus, so don't go telling us we are bigots. No, they were bigots. No, World Vision is bigot. And with our money, and that's what offends me more than their personal predilections toward immorality. Why does this practice continue? Well, why does this continue? You, you write a letter to the president and ask him why this continues. He says, well, we're considering each of these on a case-by-case -case basis. We recently learned what that phrase means to the Justice Department. Uh, Justice Department says you can discriminate if you sign a document that basically says this, uh, we, we, we must hire of our own religion because it would hurt our sense of mission to have to hire people with differing viewpoints. This is referred to as self-certification. Self-certification. See, who needs to examine the books of Wall Street, the procedures, the health of the beef industry in America? We could just ask people in the business if they are comfortable with the products they are selling just the way they are. Self-certification. We could save so much money if we did that. Um, I, I want to mention just the tax laws. Many of you have problems with the tax laws. Churches and other charities are given something called a 501c3 exemption, which means they don't have to pay any taxes and contributions to them are tax exempt. Um, churches, by the way, get that status automatically. Some of us have to apply for it. If we all formed a church right now and sent in notice, we wouldn't have to prove anything. 
One rule, though, for 501c3s, they cannot engage in partisan political activity. They cannot endorse or oppose candidates for public office, never, not at all. Over the past few years, we have been reporting, oh, in the last election cycle, about 30 egregious cases of public politicking for or against candidates. How egregious, like not allowing people to get on the church bus to take them to the polling place unless they agreed in advance to vote Republican. Telling people that voting for Barack Obama, you could do it, but it was like voting for Hitler and Stalin at the same time. Just a little over the edge. But those complaints have languished for years because a judge in 2010 ruled that the IRS needed to rewrite a single sentence to have a slightly more senior official at the IRS sign off on investigations of religious entities. This administration has failed to make this one sentence change for the past four years. Two monkeys locked in a room with a single typewriter that could have typed the right fix through random key pecking in about a month and a half. But it's taken this administration four and a half years and they still haven't done it. President Barack Obama needs to change these things about the faith-based initiative and giving money to bigots. It needs to change the tax laws that allow religious groups to do this. And guess what? Guess what? Hey, this is not going to be something where the public will rise up in arms because two-thirds of Americans already in polls believe that if you have a tax exemption as a church, you shouldn't be allowed to endorse candidates. Two-thirds of Americans already believe that if you get government grants and contracts, you should hire the best person for the job, not a person that's favored by your religion. So we've already convinced the public of that. We just have to have the politicians go along. Um, I, I'm just about out of time, but I, I just I feel like I have to say one thing else, because I did promise you that I would give you some more hints about how to promote atheism. The United States government came in opposite Americans United on a case involving two women, one's an atheist and one is Jewish, who objected to Christian-only prayers at town council meetings in the town of Greece, New York, near Rochester, New York. The government came in on the side of Christian-only prayer. Can you believe this? Yes. Yeah, I, well, see, this is an audience where you would say that. Now, what was their argument? They said, well, look, if, I mean, if we get rid of prayers at these local entities, maybe the Congress won't be able to start its sessions with a prayer either. To which I said, yeah, that's great. No, no, wait, wait. This is my advice, though. If you want more ammunition in the weapon that says prayer doesn't actually do anything good, just remember, the United States House of Representatives has a prayer every morning, and I cannot think of a damn good thing they have done for four and a half years. Um, we're going to be good. We're going to prevail. We got, we got bad judges around. There are going to be bad decisions. Bad things are going to happen. This, I'm not Pollyanna. We're going to have some t troubles ahead. But the trajectory, in my judgment, is all in our favor. And here is my final thought, of, a final bit of advice to my non-theistic brothers and sisters. Never discount the impact that you have already had. You've come a long way from the days in the 1940s when an atheist book could not be printed even by most private publishers. They were afraid to do it. You've come a long distance from the time when an atheist book under federal law could not be sent through the mail because it would be a federal crime. You've come a long way since atheists like Herb Silverman had to sue just to run for office in a state that barred non-believers from holding any public office, any at all. You've come a long way from the days when Phil Donahue was pilloried for having Madeleine Murray O'Hare on his national television show, and he had her on more than any other single guest. And now the change is David Silverman goes and kicks the behind of Bill O'Reilly on Bill's own show. You have come a long way. Sometimes, 
sometimes I hear, sometimes I, I hear uh, people say, well, why should we help the atheists? I mean, what did they ever do? You were the leaders in many cities during the civil rights movement in the struggle to end segregation, but that was an era when a Baptist preacher might be happy to have a rabbi or a priest join him in a march through your town, but would never have thought to invite an open atheist to join him. That is not your problem. That was our problem. You're some of the earliest advocates for the availability of contraceptives to give men and women the ability to make medical, moral, and economic decisions. People like the great Bill Baird, who's still with us, still speaking. You're today asking some of the most challenging questions of the faithful. You're being self-critical about the stain of racism and sexism in your culture and within your own communities, something most other movements do not touch. It's a pleasure to work with you in Washington and around the country, with you and with your brother and sister organizations on the very principles that are going to allow us to act together and for all of us to be seen as the first-class citizens we are in every city, in every town, in every state, throughout every country. No matter what we believe, no matter what we reject, this is what we need to do together to transcend the differences we have to make sure that we have a constitution that preserves the right of each and every one of us 100% of the time. Thanks so much for having me here.